Hello and welcome to For the Love of Truth. I'm called Adrian and I'd like to take this opportunity to wish you a happy new year and it is new year according to the Gregorian calendar. In this episode I am speaking to Jason Brett Searle about his film RK Types which is the film I recently recommended you watch. And if you haven't watched that and you'd like to there will be a link in the description of this podcast. It was a really interesting discussion we had, and it was good to get his take on why he created the film and what he wanted to achieve with that. And he also goes on to explain the difficulties he's had in getting a distributor to actually distribute the film. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did, and I'm looking forward so much to seeing you in the next discussion. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. Jason, thanks so much for uh, taking the time out of your day to join me to discuss your latest film. My pleasure, Adrian. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and it's, uh, I really enjoyed that, uh, what I thought would be a brief chat the other day that went on for nearly two hours. <laughs> oh, it could have been yeah. way longer. I know. <laughs> a number of different interesting pieces, didn't we? Yeah. No, it was really good. It was really good. So I thought probably what the best way to do this would be, because I've suggested people watch the film, a lot of people come back and said it was really good. But if you could just kind of give us an overview of the concepts behind it and then maybe we can dig into that a little bit more and unpack some of that. Okay, so basically I came across this idea, the RK selection theory, Mm -hmm. which I wasn't familiar with, but there was this book, uh, The Psychology of Political Evolution, I believe it's called, and it's written by Anonymous Conservative. Um. And I came across this book and it it put forward the idea of RK selection, which is, it's a biological theory that came about at the end of the 60s by um, an ecologist, Robert MacArthur, and a naturalist, E.O. Wilson. Um, And they were studying different species in some islands, Pacific islands, I think. And they started to observe that natural world there's a a trade-off between the quality and quantity of offspring Mm -hmm. and so this trade-off creates a sort of spectrum with r at one end k at the other there's no real species that's ultimately either it's everything somewhere on the spectrum Mm -hmm. um but it's just a natural law that you can see that if you're going to have lots of offspring, you can't give them the same attention mm-hmm. as if you have a few offspring. So that's the trade-off. There, there seem to be different strategies, um, selectivity, reproduction strategies, whereby animals will either tend towards our selection, which means have lots of offspring, don't need to do much to them, some of them will survive. Usually a lot of them will get killed as well, but some of them will survive, and that's the strategy. Mm -hmm. And then case selection at the other end is have very few offspring, a lot of parental care, a lot of um, teaching um, or or showing that offspring, that child, how to live in the world, uh, giving the strategies for life, and uh, fewer will die off, but you know, you only have a few to survive anyway. So there's this kind of, this observation is called a theory, but it really, it's, it's clearly to me an observation of nature, you know. It does get into theory if you start to see what underpins this, whether it's, whether it's genetic, epigenetic, or morphogenetic, or to me that's really beside the point of where I was trying to go with this film. There's a simple observation, and I think, when your attention is drawn to it it's quite clear to see in the animal kingdom and its reflection in the human population so this book introduced me to the idea of rk selection but it also went a step further and proposed that human beings although on the whole we're pretty case selected we generally have small offspring they require a massive amount of time and education to live in this world before we can sort of cut them loose, you know. Um, So there seems to be an extremely uh, definite parallel between 
a tendency towards R that manifests in the human population as liberalism, political liberalism, um, and uh, a K tendency that manifests as conservatism. And so this book sort of went through some of the, you know, policies of both sides uh, and, and how it relates to this ultimate RK trade-off between uh, quality and quantity of, of offspring and how, um, you know, the K requires order and the R thrives in chaos and all these sort of differences between the R and K, how they manifest in the human population um and sort of it was it was one of those sort of real mind opening moments where you're suddenly given this new filter to see reality through you know um and through that there's i i found a couple of other people there's there's very few people who have touched upon this how r and k manifest in the human population another there's another canadian psychologist professor are uh, Philippe Rushton, who did some investigation into this, and, and he came at it from a um, from the point of view of human the different racial differences of R and K, and of course you can imagine he got absolutely destroyed for even suggesting that there might be these differences. But clearly there are these differences, and it was funny because he sort of established that on the R K spectrum, generally the black race is towards more towards R, the white race is somewhere in the middle and Oriental Eastern races are uh, towards K. And, um, you know, they accused him of being a, a white supremacist, but <laughs> he would be an Oriental supremacist, if anything, you know. Um, but really no one's touched on this theme and and I've been a, a conspiracy theorist for some time now um, and seeing these, these sort of hidden connections, not so hidden now. Um, and it became very clear to me very quickly that all the agendas, the top down agendas that are being pushed on us are all having the effect of pushing us towards the R selective strategy and pushing us away from k k is becoming more and more taboo and r is becoming the new progressive kind of future that we're heading to like without exception type thing this is how it all just fell into place and once again i was just sort of bowled over it's like oh my god they're they're using these biological principles because I, I, some years ago, I did a documentary called Mind Your Mind, a primer for psychological independence. And this was after I'd studied NLP. And it was on the back of all this NLP stuff where once again, I was given this new filter and, and seeing the world anew through this filter and go, oh my God, they're using this technique, you know, watching uh, TV and publicity and what have you. And you're putting names to the, to the, to the you know, the, the techniques that they're using against you. So that was, you know, the, the first documentary was kind of on that slant. And this is really similar in many ways, but, but biologically, they're using biological, um, our biological nature that's obviously unconscious, as a lot of the NLP and psychological manipulation is, um, to, to move us one way or the other. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the basis of, of the documentary and it goes into sort of different themes like the destruction of the family and it goes into immigration and it goes into a lot of subjects that are becoming more and more difficult to talk about these days. And, um, I originally tried to, because the mind your mind is, is distributed. It's got a distributor in the UK and, and in the States. And I kind of just went the same route and sent it and politely declined. Oh, this is, this is better. The other one's way more amateur. What's going on? And so, you know, went down the list of distributors and 
thank you very much. We wish you all the best with your project, but, um, you know, not what we're looking for. And one, one of the distributors was honest enough to say, look, man, this is really good. I thought it was really good, but you, it's tough. You know, you're touching on a lot of points that are very, very polemic right now, you know? So, um, so yeah, I kind of sat on it for a while. Didn't, didn't quite know what to do. Um, and then one of those days cleaning up my computer and it was like this documentary and I watched it through again. It was like, man, this is good. This is powerful stuff. People need to know this, you know? So I sort of decided to go the route of at least putting it out there on, on sort of my YouTube channel and, and rumble and, and at least get some feedback and some viewers and, and let it loose, you know, cause I'm interested in the sort of discourse that comes once this idea is sort of freed, freed into the larger population, because it's not being spoken about. You can, you can find any sort of conspiratorial idea and there's several people talking about it and there's quite a bit of content about it. This, there's nothing as far as I've, I've come across and I'm very interested in starting that discussion and, and feeding it through everyone else's sort of minds and knowledge and, and seeing what they come back with. I've already got some interesting points like, you know, from yourself, the first conversation we had and you spoke about the, um, the 11 points of the, the Frankfurt school, no? And the plan of the sort of destruction of Europe and, and these sort of things, which I hadn't considered myself. But once you said it to me, it was like, my God, yeah, absolutely true. No? Yeah, no, it, it's, yeah, it was, as I was watching it, that jumped straight to mind. I was like, yep, I've seen that before. <laughs> yeah, well, they are, you know, there's the promotion of homosexuality and alternative sexual lifestyles. And What, you mean the 953,000 different genders now? Yeah, yeah, and increasing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, those are things that once you open the door, I, I don't think people realized when... There are certain doors, once you open, it's like there's no end to it. You know, we're now, we're now getting into the trans species, aren't we? I can be a cat if I want to be a cat. You know, there was even a case in a school in Australia or something where they put cat litter in a classroom for one of the students who identified as a cat. Okay. So, I, I think I'd be doing other things anyway. with that little one there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, it, I think one of the challenges, it, it's, it's good that you want to bring this and have a discussion about it. Because one of the challenges is that we're no longer allowed to question ideology and, and, and you know, apply any logic to it, any reasoning, any questioning, anything. It's, and that, that is worrying to me because you get people just blindly accepting stuff and then running away with it. So they're saying, just hang on a sec, let's just kick this around a bit and chew on it a little bit and see where it takes us. Which is another, you know, if we look at the sort of liberalism, conservative, um, the differences between them, there's a, there's a quite funny quote by Roosevelt, I think, who says, if you want to anger a conservative, lie to him. If you want to anger a liberal, tell him the truth. You know, <laughs> and there's, there is an element of truth in that in that the liberal is their sort of underpinning of the world is in ideology and the conservative tends to be in reality, right? So, you know, obviously the conservative lives with, with ideology as well. I mean, this isn't a black and white thing and it's not like all conservatives are, are full on truth seekers, no. They, there's ideology there, but, but you can kind of see a predisposition towards one or the other, you know, and you definitely see in the, in the sort of extreme left, modern day left, a absolute disconnect between reality and what they consider to be their ideological um, position, you know, and hence, if you say you're a woman, you're a woman, doesn't matter. It's okay. Because they've, they've sort of, they've invested so much in tolerance, their version of tolerance, that it would be rude to tell someone no. You know, if they say they're a cat, 
and they're not, you know, the, the typical throw off, if they're not harming anyone, you know, and there's, there's all sorts of well, dangers. That, that's a big one to hang in front of someone, the harm thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, um, but there was, I read an interesting comment in, um, the video that you put out about this film and, and the other one. And I noticed you said, you know, if there are any questions and, um, Someone did make a comment there. Um, oh, what's that? Let me just see if I can. Nigel, probably. Is it Nigel? You, you, he's a lawful rebel. That's right, Nigel. Yeah, that's Nigel. Okay. Um, about halfway down. Well, yes. His the point he makes at the beginning is reason. Reason is the ultimate filter. And if we use reason, then we're safe, sort of thing. Um, Did you read my response to him as well? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I've been through, been through all of them to check, see what was there, see what might be coming. <laughs> um, and I think that's half, perhaps half the story, because reason, you can only use reason to the extent of your knowledge to the extent of the, you know, what you have consciously captured in your awareness. So I think what he's perhaps not um, giving enough attention to is the manipulation that's being utilized, whether it's biological or, or psychological, subconsciously psychological, it's all by definition unconscious. So how can you possibly apply reason to what's unconscious? You can only, by definition, apply reason to what is conscious. So the more knowledge, true knowledge that you can acquire, the greater your capacity for reason. Um, so once again, these, these aspects of our biological predispositions, unless you're aware of them, unless they come into your conscious awareness, then your reason is blind to them. You know, and there are plenty of elements that are not reasonable, um, you know, in the sense of our, our sexuality. There are certain consequences to our sexuality that aren't immediately uh, obvious, you know, because once again, if you apply that sort of ideal of, well, as long as they're not hurting anyone, but that's a very superficial um, Mm, it's a very superficial look at what's actually going on. I mean, you can find, for example, that the, the longer a woman delays her first sexual encounter, the more likely she is to stay in a long-term relationship. I mean, this is just borne out by statistical observations that is way beyond uh, chance. So the earlier a woman has a sexual encounter, the more likely she is to get divorced, to get separated and, and have a relationship break up. Now, is there anything reasonable behind that? Is there anything that you could reason and say, that's an obvious connection? I don't think so. I don't think, unless you acquire the knowledge of these statistical studies and so forth, um, I think it's a very hard thing to reach by one's own reason. And perhaps when you look at the, um, um, the effects of, of, you know, if we look at the inner cities of the States and, and they see that the black populations are having a hard time and a lot of people attribute this to racism and, and so on and so forth. But you, if you, uh, correlate the one parent families, you see, because you have a lot of poor immigration going on from Chinese and these sort of people, but they have a far sturdier family structure. There's far fewer one uh, single mother, uh, you know, bringing up the children. And there are all these things that you can determine as a result of this, you know, criminality and, and, um, and uh, mental issues and uh, there are several things that come out of this that aren't ap apparent at all because 
using my reason, I would say, well, as long as a child receives love and, and has a stable environment, it doesn't really matter if one of the parents is absent or not. So, yes, I think he's, he's partial in his recognition or his reification of, of um, reason as the ultimate. Because, of course, if you're very ignorant um, or nescient, rather, so you don't have a great deal of knowledge about things, and yet your reasoning is working, functioning just fine, you're still going to fall prey to these manipulative manipulative techniques as anyone else's so i think there's a there's a lot to be said for expanding our awareness and becoming aware of more things and therefore our reason will be more effective and and whilst we're on his comment we can um because because he then goes on to what was he saying let me bring this up here um he actually says question for the man how does he determine that extreme K-type selection in humans would lead to rigidity, dogmatism, inequality, narrow-mindedness, end quote? And how could it result in the lacking of freedom that humanity needs to thrive, end quote? But perhaps more seriously, how does he determine that extreme R-type selection would result in pathological individualism, end quote? This doesn't make any sense at all, especially with the words pathological individualism slotted nicely in between the words unrestrained hedonism, indulgence, and chaos, end quote. Why on earth is an attack on individualism the very opposite to the problem of impending collectivism, embedded in a list of reasonable and congruent observations? Good point. Um, he does mention collectivism in the same phrase as individualism, which, um, which I don't. So, so that does, does give it a different context if you're juxtaposing collectivism and individualism. So I suppose individualism is something that can be um, interpreted in several ways. But if we're talking about political theory, then individualism is more tied up with ethical egoism and um, uh, certain schools of thought that have been used by you know early gay rights activists to further their own agenda and it's it's kind of that um every man out for himself as long as you don't cause harm so that's the type of individualism i was referring to once again the left and right they both have their collective elements and their individual elements um so the the right is is has a collectivism of if you are if you are in favor of the rights of the individual and and you know the search for truth and so on and so forth then you're in our collective and you're part of this this conservative group that we you know um the in group for the conservatives and once again on the left you have perhaps the more ideological uh, collectivism but there's there exists collectivism and individualism on both sides depending on how you sort of choose to define these terms um, but what I meant to say is and and I hope it sort of became clearer in, in the whole context of the documentary one of the things that the R thrives in is chaos um, they are the the niche um, species that that make the most out of chaotic situations uh the k on the other hand requires order there is a, and in the documentary you know i juxtapose the sort of rabbit as the as the archetypal r and the wolf as the archetypal k and you can see that in the wolf's society there there are strong hierarchies there are very you know, there are rules and regulations that they all understand and live by. Um, so when you take K to an extreme, then you can, a society that's extremely K can become overly rigid and overly ordered. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't um, allow for the flow, the natural flow that we must be able to, to, 
to come up against in this ever-changing sort of world that we live in, you know? Sounds like China. On, huh? Sounds like China. <laughs> Sounds like China. Yeah, yes, too much, too much order is obviously a bad thing, and that's why I use the word pathological there, you know? That we can have pathological order as we can have pathological chaos. Um, so once again, the individualism that I'm referring to in the R is the, 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 the ethical egoism of I'm out for myself. That's it. As long as I don't harm you, leave me alone. I can do what I want sexually. I can do, you know, that's the sort of bottom line. Um, and once again, it's played out more in the rabbit population where it's, we don't, you know, a predator comes, we just run away. We ain't every man for himself, every rabbit for himself type thing. Um, there isn't that sort of group think that can become pathological, but, but is a useful part of human uh, society. So I think in the closing statements of my documentary, I'm proposing that and I do state at the end, because the whole documentary seems to be a kind of rant against R in some ways. Um, but then I correct that in the end saying, if the whole agenda was K, 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 then this documentary perhaps would be the opposite. You know, because what I'm trying to establish and what I believe is to be mo most conducive to, to, um, to benefit the greater number is the correct balance you know everything is about balance the buddha talked about balance biology is about homeostasis which is a biological balance um so i'm by no means saying we want to be k all the way because that on the one hand would lead to rigidity it would lead to dogmatism it would lead to all these things that k has a predisposition towards and that has to be sort of balanced by an element of R. Um, but it's the finding of that balance that I'm not entirely sure about, that I'm kind of throwing out as a question to the viewers as well, um, as to what would be the appropriate balance that would be the, the sort of optimal human society. But it definitely is going way too far towards R and being intentionally pushed there by certain people for their own interests and yeah, against well, that, our own. that to me was what i took from the, from the movie was that there was a very definite push in that direction yeah and That's and good. because a, a, a um a population of r types are very easy to manipulate herd and control and it's Absolutely. not as easy to herd a bunch of wolves we're using the example you gave yeah that's that's ultimately what they're looking for the the predispositions of the R, if you're a tyrannical dictator and you're looking to sort of, you know, cajole and manipulate a, a group of people, then it would be far easier if they're all R tending than K tending. K tending has a whole other back, uh, backup of family and local community and so on and so forth that R doesn't tend to have, nor do they tend to need. Often we're trapped in our own definitions of words. I think we have to be very aware of that. And when exactly. we're talking, listening to someone else, we have to go, well, how are they using this word? I know I use it this way, but it's not my word. I don't own it. And, 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 and definitions are kind of quite fluid. So I can kind of see individualism because I hear that thrown around a lot even in sort of more conservative uh, uh, libertarianism type philosophies, which, yes, yeah, I, ca I can grasp that and I can see how it's used there as well. But in this context, I think it was clear that it was not talking about, talking about it in that sense. I could have perhaps used narcissism or egotism as in the individualism of the ego. You know, so yeah, the last, the last um, paragraph of lawful rebel here. When I combine the observation in the first paragraph above with the last question, I'm left with a disturbing sense of possible foul play. 
Lastly, the ability to hack anyone's biology with respect to sexual behavior is easily and re readily remedied by simply being more conscious, by thinking for oneself and by choosing one's behavior according to a rational standard of value. If one is a zombie, then indeed one has cause for concern, but no thinking individual needs seriously worry about having their biology hacked in this manner. Conscious choice can easily override implicit subconscious suggestion. What do you think? Um, well, it, it's here he gives, he does touch on the other point that I was trying to, you know, um, balance this with. And he says, it's easily and readily remedied by simply being more conscious. So that's not reason. That's the other side, knowledge, right? Becoming more conscious, more aware implies that you're becoming more knowledgeable about the, 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 um, the elements that you're dealing with, no? So the more elements that you can be aware of, that you can manage in your conscious awareness rather than your unconscious, um, the more your, your reason will be more fruitful and, uh, and so, yeah, he, he even touches upon that to, to sort of give the other side. But I do think we have to realize that, you know, reason without knowledge is, is sterile to some extent, as is knowledge without reason. Yeah. Well, it just back to the same thing. It requires balance. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and every, everything, everything requires balance. And, and I think one of the interesting things, and that's why when I did the, the introduction to your video, it is a lens or a filter, as you said. It's it's to give you a different way of looking at stuff. I, I used to do a lot of work with databases and big data sets, mm. and you are constantly looking for patterns so that you can create filters, and that's exactly what you've done with this. You've highlighted some patterns, and you've given people the ability to apply a filter and say, well, what am I seeing here? Is this actually going on? And then what does this mean, and what can I do with it? Absolutely. So it's another tool for your tool bag. It's not the tool. It's just another tool. Which actually, I think he, he started off by saying, yeah, he says at the beginning, this film looks like yet another attempt to find the ultimate lens to look through in order to explain the world around us. And I'd say to that, no, not, not, not an ultimate lens, but like you've said, another lens. I think it's definitely in, in our psychological toolbox, it's a very useful lens to look at things through and to gain a different perspective. And the more I sort of grow and learn, the more I'm not looking for an ultimate perspective. I don't think truth is a perspective. I think truth is the ability to, to manage simultaneously a whole spectrum of different perspectives on the same thing. And I think the greater your palais of perspectives, the closer that you can sort of move towards the thing itself or the truth that you're trying to yeah. understand. Yeah, I, I, I would go with that, absolutely. And the ability to take on an idea and float with it and let it become yours, but you don't become its, you know, so that you can actually give it much deeper consideration rather than just brush it off or give it a surface look. And that, that takes some persistence and some focus, but it gives you a richer view you know, so instead of seeing four or five colors, you might see five or 6,000 or 100,000 or a million colors. And that gives you a better kind of grasp as to what's actually at play because there is so much subtle stuff being played out right now. It's extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. But it also takes that inner work that frees you up because unfortunately what, what tends to happen is that knowledge or, or understanding... Um, becomes possessed by our personality it, you know the more these things are taken up by our personality as an expression of who we are the less likely we are to 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 mm, flow when we're approached or confronted with um uh, information that contradicts those postures that we intellectual postures that we might take you know so I think a big part of if anyone wants to, if anyone is genuine in their sort of search for truth, I think there's a big process of, of sanitizing your, how much of your personality depends on thinking one way or another. You know, the less your personality can depend on being 
you know, once again, it's, it's this sort of left and right, R and K. Um, people, if I show this documentary to people on the left, well, I'm all right, aren't I? Just by definition. And I'm, I, I would say that as someone who is genuinely looking for truth, I can't afford to be any of that. I can't afford to put myself in any of those boxes. I, I wish to be free, free enough from them to be able to see them objectively and to appreciate left's policies when they are beneficial and, and right's policies when they're beneficial. Obviously, no one is wrong 100% of the time. You know, a broken clock tells the time, gets the time right twice a day. Um, so I think anything, even blatant lies, often have a seed of truth in them. And the discerning person, discerning man or woman, um, I think their job is to, 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 to find the wheat from the chaff in everything and in all things. And the further away you can say, you know, as soon as you say, I'm a conservative, then you've <laughs> limited yourself. Yeah, you just put, yeah. close the lid and go on. Okay, so this is it becomes a filter, a coloured filter, you know, for for all of your observations, and everything is passed through this um, through this bias in in some sense. Yeah, well, that, so, that's uh, actually a powerful question you could ask yourself. Then is how am I filtering this, and what biases am I unknowingly applying to it? Yeah. Because we all are. And those biases, perhaps, as we work through them, become more and more subtle. But nevertheless, they remain, you know, and um, and all sorts of. Uh, the more we can transcend self selfishness in all its manifestations, the 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 freer we are to confront reality, because at times, you know, you want to you want to t twist things to your own wishes in the sense of you'd like that to be true. I'd like, you know, th there are often ideas that you come across and you can definitely feel in yourself. Well, I hope it's not like that. I'd rather it was like that. So there's, there's, there's a selfish tendency that if you want to approach the truth, even that you have to do away with, you know? And I think one of the massive things that, um, that are holding conventional people back from going down the rabbit hole is confronting a whole lot of darkness in the world that you don't want to accept exists because you're living in a kind of naive version of reality where, yeah, there's corrupt politicians. Yeah, there's, you know, there's criminals and stuff, but this whole sort of, grand conspiracy of some powerful personages at the top pretty much doing everything they can to make us sick and dumb down and 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 depopulate us and that's that's a, a big step to take you know and obviously most of the time it happens in in baby steps you know i i certainly when i look at my sort of journey it certainly happened like that. And there were, there were ideas that I was confronted with years ago. There was like, nah, nah. Yeah. That's you know, not nah, <laughs> money. Yeah. The, the money system is corrupt and the federal reserve is crazy. And that's kind of one of the first things that I started looking into and, and wising up on, on, you know, was how, how our whole banking system has just been sabotaged and subverted, you know? Um, and once again, people don't know about that at all, for the most part. The man on the street, you say the Bank of England, Bank of England belongs to England, doesn't it? Well, you know, federal <laughs> no. Reserve, it's, it's not federal and it has no reserves. I mean, it's like... That's about as federal as Federal what, Express. <laughs> <laughs> you can call it what you want, but it is what it is. Um, but yeah, it takes time to, to open more and more to, to these other ideas, you know. Yeah, and, 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 you know, documentaries like yours and, and there's plenty of others out there that also just allow you to start looking and saying, hang on a sec, I hadn't considered that. And that, that's where the real power is. 
And I, I think it's, it's difficult because as you get further down this road, down your own road, because you and I were talking, we've, we've got our own views on the same sort of target. And that's why it's important to have these discussions because you can start to get a better, more accurate triangulated position, if you will, as to actually what's going on. Yeah. That as you, as you go off down that road, you don't want to lose sight of what it is you're trying to find out because it's way too easy to get sidetracked and there's all these kind of little rabbit holes that you're going to get shoved down that they may or may not have importance, they may or may not contain the truth, but are they relevant to where you're at right now? Mm. Or are you just being manipulated again to take your eye off the ball? Yeah, and entertained. A lot of it's yeah. entertaining. That's all it is. <laughs> uh, and you get caught up in that because yep. some of these... Uh, yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I've, I've got a lot of positive feedback from the documentary and the common, a common response is, wow, you've suddenly joined a whole lot of dots with this information that were previously just sort of disparate and disconnected and um and i think yeah that's perhaps one of the one of the common and useful points of of this information is that it it does connect some previously unconnected dots that you think well yeah there's this agenda going on there's this agenda going on and you know we know we know it's coming from the top down because i think that's something we have to establish it runs downhill doesn't it there you go it does <laughs> yeah and we're not seeing for the most of for the most part a grassroots natural you know bubbling up of of change that comes through through men and women you know navigating this ever changing world that we live in we're definitely seeing agendas that are being pushed on us and the majority aren't don't have their ideological minds in those places you know but of course they're doing it in a certain way so that you're the pariah if you don't you know if you if you say something against this you know the typical you're a racist you're a homophobe you're a fascist you're a, all these all these, you know, conspiracy theorists, which thankfully that's coming out. This was something I mentioned in a video some time ago about how the CIA created the term. That's right, yeah. Conspiracy theorist. Yeah, yeah. After the Kennedy assassination. Yeah. Because there were too many people going, hold on a minute. Yep. How does this bullet go? Yeah. Well, and, um, the other thing is, if you look at it, a, th a theory is an idea. That's all it is. Yeah. If you have any kind of evidence, anything, even just one piece, it becomes a possibility. So it's no longer a theory. And if there's more evidence, it becomes a probability until it becomes proven. So the whole idea of conspiracy theory that someone throws out at you when there's actually stuff you can look at to say, well, actually, that's, pro that's possible. It is possible. It's, it's funny, though, because it's a term that in itself is, there's nothing derogatory about it. But they've, over the years, they've loaded it with all these derogatory terms, you know, so, it, so it's kind of become this sort of, uh, insult, but um, which it's is like, it's like boiling a frog, isn't it? You know, you don't notice it's happening until it's too late, and that's that's what happens with a lot of these ideas. You know, you don't walk into a forest one day and see a three hundred foot sequoia. Yeah, but if you came back a couple hundred years ago, you'd have found a little seedling about that big. Yeah, you know, so you, you people tend to arrive at these fully formed ideas without tracking back and realizing there's been a nice slow progression, slow enough that most people don't notice it. Yeah. You know, and then you, you cross a few generations and before you know it, the thing's here and the truth's gone. Yeah, absolutely. Have you seen any work by Kurt Kallenbach? Uh, rings a bell. Who, who's... Uh, he, he talks about um, how the birth certificates were actually created. And he talks about um, the fact that you were not created when you were born. You were created nine months earlier at the point of fertilization. Right. Okay. And that when you were born, they cut the cord and they dismember you. They steal your organ and they give the organ the birth certificate name. Right. There's, yeah, there's, there's similar ideas that the, that the, because obviously the, the, the birth Placenta. certificate represents yeah. the dead fiction. That's right. Right. Um, I've also heard ideas that it's the placenta. That's right. Yeah, the placenta. Yeah, the dead 
Um, well, the thing is, it's alive at the time. If you if you, and this isn't the, the place for that discussion. We can have another discussion of it. I'll send you a load of links on it. <laughs> but it, it's interesting to note that is worth exploring because at the time, their their definition of birth. I'd have to look it up again, but it includes anything that's alive. Well, at the time, it was alive because there was a pulse. Yes. And it continues to pulse, and it should continue yeah. to pulse for several hours until they kill it, and they dismember it, and they steal it from you. So we're all effectively victims of organ trafficking. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's in effect, it's stillborn. So born alive and then dies shortly afterwards. Right, which means they can issue the death certificate, and now they control the trust. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Is, but there is a point there. I mean, there's, there's many different paths when you start looking into that whole free man, you know, uh, call it what you will sort of thing. Um, and I think there's a lot of people who talk about it in terms of you're a slave, they've registered you and you're a slave. And it's like, I think we have to recognize that, no, there was a, a legal fiction created at that point, but it never undermines the living man or woman. That's right. But you can be mind controlled and hypnotized into thinking you are that controlled individual. Absolutely. But what I'm seeing in certain aspects of even the free man sort of community is, is a talking about it as though, as though this, this thing that happened at your birth has somehow led to your slavery. It's like, no, there's, there's, there's been a consensual situation that's arisen because of your ignorance. But as soon as you become aware of it, there are steps that you can take, and even the recognition of it is a step that you've taken. So, I mean, there is, there is the free living man and woman at all times, you know, not in slavery, but there is this whole con that's taken place with the legal fiction, all caps name, that you haven't been able to distinguish from the living man or woman that you can sun consent with unwittingly and acquiesce to certain things because of your ignorance, no? Um, but yeah, I think there's an there's a important uh, distinction to be made that you are, as a man and woman, always free, and you've only given away... I mean, it's like the, the sort of the straw man is a hat that you can wear, you know? I refer to Up it as until a coat now, you put on. Eh? I refer to it as a coat you put on. Yeah. And it's that coat that you've been wearing all the time. But as soon as you realize it, you can take the coat off and hang it up. And when it's convenient, put the coat on. You want to do some commerce. And um, so, yeah, my, my path with that sort of stuff, it seems where I am anyway. I'm in Spain. And dealing with authorities on their level, in their jurisdiction, as a commercial interaction, has been more profitable to me than trying to play the game of, no, I'm a living man, and I, you know, um, that doesn't tend to work because you've been underpinning this legal fiction since birth. So you either have to take certain very clear steps to determine that you know distinction before these supposed authorities otherwise that presumption just carries on and and your sort of your claim to being a living man at least as i've seen it is is bowled over because you know jurisdictions don't mix the law of the land and the law of the sea are two different laws the sea isn't on the land they can con you into thinking so but it isn't yeah, that's right. Yeah. Did you like My that fact. video I did? <laughs> huh? Did you like that video I did or that picture I sent you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, the, which courthouse was it? I forget. The courthouse. Uh, in... It was um, in Florida. In but Miami, I, mean, I think it was, yeah. There's a couple that I've seen like that. Not so blatant. It's um, for, for the viewers. I mean, it's a, it's a ship-shaped courthouse, isn't it? On, on stilts. Oh, it's and, not, and, it's and even the ground crazy. has been manipulated to look like waves in water. Even the lawn. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Been, so, I mean, that's the most 
exaggerated example I've seen yet of that, but there are a few that are sort of ship-like and so, yeah, they're telling you if you've got eyes to see it. That's right, and ears to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That was um, that was really enjoyable, and I'm looking forward to some other discussions on other topics as well. Absolutely. So I think, you know, judging by the first chat we had, there's there's a number of, of overlaps, and um, having been subscribed to your channel as well for some time, that was one of the things. It was like uh, I originally got a recommended video. I think maybe it was about magnesium or something like that. Um, but then it was like, oh, the distilled water, oh, the free man type stuff. Oh my God, he's all <laughs> these different iodine and all these things that I've kind of in my own search have, have got into and, and, uh, looked into, you know? Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll send you links to a guy called, um, or a conversation. There's a guy called, or you goes by the name of Sui Generis, which is worth looking up the Latin of that. Okay. Um, and he I took him. Sui, Sui... Generis. Generis. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He um he took it upon himself to look at the documents that are created from the time of birth, and he sent over I think it was two thousand emails to hundreds of officials right through the Vatican and everywhere to then create this paper trail so that he can demonstrate the fraud accurately. And it's absolutely when you listen to it, it's like that's amazing. I think you'll really enjoy it. So I'll send you that through as well. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And it also so, yeah. demonstrates that the people that are involved in that on the other side have no idea of what they're actually involved in. They're simply doing what they've been taught to do. Well, that's why it works. If it wasn't like that, then you couldn't get everyone to you know, be in on it. It's like if so. you want to know how that works, read 48 Laws of Power by Richard Green, which is a very disturbing book, but that highlights all of that. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'll check that out too. Yeah, it, it, it really does about how to create compartments. I, I first came across it when I was trying to work out how a guy was ripping people off to the mm -hmm. tune of hundreds of millions. And because everyone I spoke to in the organization had no concept and thought I'd lost my mind for even suggesting it. And it's only when I got far enough back and started to put the compartments together and then noticed the workflow between the compartments that the scam became obvious. Mm -hmm. But it yeah. took months of work to do that and a lot of head scratching and thinking... <laughs> And it's when I read the book, I went, holy shit, okay, let's try from that lens, that, that tool, and then, then I got it. Yeah, well, most people don't want to do shady stuff. But if you can invert the reality to the extent where the, you know, it's, have you heard of the term of toxic mimics? No. It's, it's this idea that... Um, you keep the form the same and you invert or change the content. And for the most part, people don't get it because the form's the same. Form is the same they've always recognized. So, you know, you can take the idea of charity. The form of charity, what's charity about? Charity is to help people. So if I give to charity, charity helps people. There's the form. We've seen this inversion over the years where now, you know, charities are testing their vaccines on black population in Africa or what have you, all of this sort of stuff. Um, so, but people are still giving to charities because the form is the same. The form is good. We're doing good. Our adverts, we're doing good. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really that principle, isn't it? You, you can get a lot of people to do very shady stuff as long as they think they're doing good. Yeah, that is going to make an awesome little soundbite as well. Because <laughs> <laughs> as we're going through this, I was thinking about bits I can pick out. <laughs> cool. All right, it's been a real pleasure, my friend. Thank yeah. you so much once again. And let me get all this edited up. I've got a few things to do in the next few days. When I get it done, I'll forward it across to you so you can share it as well if you want. Yes, And absolutely. let's book another time to have another chat. Excellent. Yeah, look after yourself, mate. Take, Take care. care. Thanks again. Bye-bye.